dominion be unto thee, my blessed Lord. Blessing, glory, and honor, power and might and dominion be unto thee, my blessed Lord. Come thou throne of thy died on the cross for me. Father, we thank you for your presence in our midst today. Thank you for that great love wherewith you loved us. We bask in your love and appreciate, Father, all that you've done for us. Thy faithfulness and thy mercies are new every morning. We just love you back. Minister to us in our time together today. We chew on heavy issues. We do need you. We pray that love will cover a multitude of mistakes and sins. We pray that you'll bind our hearts together in love. Thank you for the body of Christ. Thank you for that life of which we all partake. We look forward, Father, for that good work you're going to do in us today. We're expecting. Thank you for your faithfulness thus far this week in being merciful to our students. We pray, Lord, that you'll give them that grace right to the end to get everything done. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> what do you see on the board? Square? Square? Okay. Anybody else see anything else? Circle and a square. Circle and a complete. Right. Just a minute. There wasn't anybody, there wasn't anybody, you know, really going to give me too hard a time. The fact that this circle wasn't quite complete. You saw that? Or this was a perfect square. That's really not quite a perfect square, is it? I mean, uh, it's a bit, uh, off there, isn't it? But you saw what you needed to see. I mean, that it was adequate for you. You saw a square and you saw a really it's a curved line. Because you see, that much keeps it from being a circle, doesn't it? But you saw what you needed to see. You saw what was adequate for you to see. You completed the picture, didn't you? Even though it's not there, that's not really a circle, is it? I mean, it approximates a circle. You could say that, right? But it's not really a circle, right? You saw what you wanted or needed to see, a circle. It's really a curved line. And here, you're not going to get too much, give me too much trouble over that little corner there, but you'll let settle for a square. I'm just trying to show you, my brethren, that it's a very common thing that we do sometimes. <laughs> it's called selective perception. Oh, we should put it down. <laughs> And this is a simple, common illustration. Um, every class that gets this idea introduced to them, most of them see a circle and most of them see a true square. <laughs> to be a square, all sides have to be equal, right? To be a circle, of course, there has to be the closure. Selective perception. The definition of the, the functional definition of perception, selective perception, is that we see and hear what we need or want to see and hear. Please put it down. It's very important. I'm going to give you a very practical illustration. We see and hear what we need or want to see and hear. The fact of the matter is I did have a young man up front say that was not a complete circle. Okay, he did not have a need in his mind or life to say that was a complete circle. <laughs> I mean, that, that was a circle. He saw a curved line. Okay, did you had you have you seen this before? Did anybody mm -hmm. test this? Out? It's just the way it was. Of course, he was more accurate, but it was not that big a deal to any of you. You just thought I was up there whipping out a circle and just met, just forgot to close it, right? Right, right? So you said circle, and that was just an imperfect square. Okay. Selective perception. We will complete a picture to meet our needs. <coughs> oh. 
put it down. You, we will complete a picture to meet our own expectations, our own needs. Hmm. And the Lord gave us a real practical example. I had an experience today where an important staff member reported to another staff member that you better not go see Davis about that issue. Davis teaches there's nothing wrong with masturbation. <laughs> <laughs> Now, somebody in this class is responsible for that. And by the Lord's grace, every single one of my lectures have been recorded, so I'm protected. But what I have said, and my position hasn't changed since the first time I've said it, <clears throat> and just to reconstruct, I'm going to read. And this, is going, I, this is the kind of thing that can destroy a man's ministry, I just want you to know. Some of you who treated this lightly and just casually said to somebody else, Davis teaches that masturbation is all right. Don't realize the significance. But right at the top to Mrs. Frieda Lindsay and a whole bunch of others, they have to get this. But among the things that I've said is masturbation never has, never will be right because one's mind is not separated from one's actions. When one desires after, while stimulating the genitalia, Jesus teaches it's sin of the heart. Proverbs, why don't you write these down? Proverbs 6.25. <coughs> This is for an adult. This is not for kids. Proverbs 6.25, Matthew 5.28, and 15.18, and Psalm 119.37. All right. Proverbs 6.25, Matthew 5.28, and 15.18, and Psalm 119.37. The idea that there is a sin of the heart. Third point that I make in my letter to try to explain myself. The only exception that I can make is for tiny children who in discovering themselves do nothing more than tickle themselves or feel good. I don't think they should be encouraged to do this, but the mechanical act is not sin for them. Now, I don't think I've said any differently, have I? Some students, fourth point, some students picked up on the idea that they could separate mechanical act from their thought life, and that is psychologically impossible. I recall in my own thinking, and I could be guilty of, of a selective perception too, but as I recall, I said, the mechanical act doesn't make it sinful, it's the thought life for an adult that makes it sinful. Okay. But I think then some will jump to the... And I even expressly said, you can't use that as an excuse to go experiment. So psychologically, I don't think it's possible. I remember saying this. I don't think it's possible for an adult to separate thinking from that performance, that sexual stimulation performance. All right. Now, why would, some, why would somebody do this? They would do this because they're out to get me, right? No. And I'm not paranoid, so I don't really believe that. Why would somebody represent this professor and really get him in hot water? It's enough to destroy the ministry. Really, it is. I could be out of here on my ear if I don't have tender, sympathetic people to listen and, and maybe check it out with the tapes that we have graciously uh, had provided for us. But uh, why would uh, somebody ever do anything like that? Well, the first reason why somebody would is possible that they have selective perception. They have a need in themselves to hear or to believe that Davis is excusing masturbation. Well, that's possible. I'm going to tell you something, my brethren. As you get into the work of the ministry, you are going to find, I was going to take this up later, but you're going to find many times, not once or twice, many times in your ministry, that people believe the most awesome things about you and your beliefs. And whenever you get into a controversial subject, and eschatology is one of those controversial subjects. People love to be party-spirited about it. You know, are you pre-trib or mid-trib or post-trib? They love to get party-spirited about things like that in, in our traditional churches. And, uh, and you'll make a statement to the effect like, uh, and I made this statement, uh, 
I can't get too dogmatic about it. I feel more comfortable as a pre-tribber, but uh, I just don't think it's important enough to fight about. I have been quoted as saying it's not important enough to take a position on. Now, why would somebody say that? Because they're out to get me? No. Because they're wicked? No. They heard what they needed or wanted to hear, right? So we need to be aware that there's a thing called selective perception. Now, I wish that were the only possibility. But there is one other possibility, and I've got to submit this because I had a student come into my office and discuss this thing with me. And it was my perception, and I don't think, and I'm aware of selective perception, I had no need to think this, it was my perception that he was looking for an excuse. Uh, for someone else, that he was counseling for himself, I don't know. Brother. <laughs> Uh, this will probably be covered by the second point that I want to make, okay? I think people can honestly make a mistake. In other words, the person that represented my, my free trip, I think I'm free trip, okay? Because I'm comfortable with it, not because I feel real strong on the scriptures on it, all right? I can see, I've heard the mid-tribbers, you know? In fact, I think my wife has a little bit of a tendency to be, you know, mid-trib. she here? She didn't make it this morning, but... Uh, and, and, and I have another friend that tends to be post-trib uh, from, from Chriswell who's real strong on it. I mean, he's real dogmatic on it. And his scriptures are good. You know, I see how he interprets it. And I'm close to the brother. And he's the only guy over at Chriswell that claims to be, you know, uh, believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, and I'm very quite close to him. <laughs> so, uh, each position is winsome to me. And I was raised pre-trib, you know, and I still, I still go that direction. And so I'm really not very dogmatic. That's really where I am. And that person who represented me is saying it's not important enough for me to take a position on probably was with me. Okay? But when it came out, it's not important enough to take a position on, it was a rebuke to somebody who was taking a strong position, see? And I was used you know, in a way that I had never communicated. I'm not against people who take a position. It's just not important enough for me to take, get dogmatic about, even though I feel more comfortable as a pre-tribulation man. See what I'm saying? That was an honest mistake. That brother or sister really wasn't trying to hurt. You know, but they used me to get the point across. Okay, but they did it in such a way that I was misrepresented. You know, and so what came out was their perception, but it wasn't really what was real from my perception. I can't say that was evil in their, in their heart. That's what I'm saying. I don't think that was evil, but there can be evil. We'll talk about that in a second. The second reason, brother. It's not the psychological dissonance. Uh, days ago, where we can all be touched in an area where perhaps we, we've got preconceived ideas and then somebody says something which sounds on the surface startling and you have to step back, regroup and put previous thoughts to one side and say now what did the person say, what is he trying to say, do I need to readjust my position or hold fast, in other words we may to be feel uncomfortable, to do yeah. I think a pro the prophetic ministry tends to uh, be given to the superlative, and so they will probably minister more of those rather harsh statements uh, to grab attention, to shake people. I think that that's a possibility. Yes, sir. But I don't use the, the word dissonance is used a little bit more carefully than that in the field of counseling. So I don't think that's the word. Your Johari window in your manual when you get into it in uh, se section three, speak healing to your relationships, talks about blind spots. I think that would be more akin to what we're talking about. Okay? Yes, sir? You know, uh, this, that, this got back to certain people by rumor, way rumor circulated. No, a number of students have carried it to faculty members. Okay? A number of them. It hasn't happened just once. It's happened a number of times. So there are multiple people who have done this in this class. <laughs> And I think, honestly, there is some selective perception with no evil intended, okay? I mean, I know you can say, well, any problem is the result of the fall, and I would accept that, all right? So you can say original sin is a, is a, is a, is a problem. That makes you feel better. A good Calvinist would have to at least say that. <laughs> yeah, I, and I can appreciate that. But I don't think there was any intent. Yes, sir? Don't remember and retain or 
I'm saying that there's, uh, and that's again part of perception, and I would say it still is selective. <laughs> you know, it's still part of the problem of selective perception. Uh, let me just show you this selective perception is so significant. Every one of you can identify with selective perception. Not a one of you selects to hear somebody who disagrees with you naturally. Are you hearing me? You can say, well, selective perception is working in everybody else, but not me. Not a one of you, I was watching the Reagan Carter debate. And I was just amazed at how I got such a terrible taste in my mouth when one of those speakers would speak, you know? Yeah. It was so obviously one-sided, you know, the one guy was a good guy and one guy was a bad guy. It really wasn't that, I don't think it, you know, in terms of true debate, it wasn't that plain. But it sure was plain to me. Why? Because I want to hear what I agree with. Yeah. Selective perception was working. And I did not, in my heart and mind, have the ability to represent the other side very well. And then I heard the people reflect on it and after it was all over. And sure enough, you know, you see the party. You know, each party lines up with this man. And they heard what they needed and wanted to hear, right? And, the, and White, who, uh, you know, was the National Democratic Committee chairman, says, Carter aced it. Carter was fantastic. <laughs> you know, and you hear, uh, you hear the uh, Republican, and he aced it. Selective perception. We want to listen to those who agree with us, and we don't want to listen to those who don't. We pick and choose. And that's dangerous because we have a tendency to become a law unto ourselves and to never be challenged. And it required a Peter to have a Paul face him head on before them all in a confrontation. Remember that? Because a Peter enjoyed being with those who reinforced all his own views. See? And it wasn't that a Peter was a wicked, was wicked. But Peter just enjoyed that reinforcement of what he believed. And, and it was easier to be selective, selectively perceptive, uh, in a sense. That was a need of him to, to have that thing, those things reinforced. But God wants us to be exercised sometimes. And so we need to hear sometimes those things that don't necessarily agree with us and be pulled out of a comfortable rut that may not be right. And in Peter's case, it wasn't right, even though he wasn't doing anything that all the rest of us don't do naturally sit beside those who make you feel more comfortable. How is that a sin? It's not a sin for most people. But as an example of the believers in that point of crisis, that time of change, it was wrong. Okay, brother? I totally agree with the selective perception. One problem I'm seeing, especially on the discussion of hand, and that is you didn't repeat that one. You didn't say that once. You were so emphatic about what your opinion was, <laughs> how it was to operate day after day for three or four different sessions, that how somebody can walk out of this class misunderstanding it. I cannot understand. Well, okay, I, I don't, I, I don't think, I don't think that I am excusing selective perception. Now, there is another element. We're going to talk about it in just a minute. But there is a problem in the heart in some people. I know that. And I'll get to it. But I want to honestly say, I really believe that some people misunderstood it. My brother says they misunderstood it because they're just not being analytical. They've never been analytical. They come right out of high school. They weren't analytical while they're going through high school and maybe sitting here. And they're just reacting. They're just kind of flowing along. okay? And they just hear what they need or want to hear. I know there are people like that. I'm not, I know, and I'm not excusing that. Uh, I'm just saying they need to be aware that this can happen, and they should be careful it doesn't happen again. You work at it. Yeah. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Because this thing called selective perception. Now, you didn't hear what the brother said. He said the statement was so strong compared to what he had been enculturated with. <laughs> that it blew him away, you see, when he heard something that disagreed with what he'd always been taught. We had someone come up and say to my wife, my wife says, we have always had it taught. And that lady proceeded to give my wife, my wife was just dramatically moved. Uh, three, I mean, it was a doctrine in their church. 
that any stimulation of the genitalia, you know, little bitty kid or any any stimulation apart from the actual marital sex act is a sin. Ipso facto, ain't no way to see it another way. <laughs> well, I mean, they had it really worked out, and so that sister was really exercised because I came. I, I mean, I I came against that concept, the way they've been taught. See, and I'm not a, I'm not against saying that it's a sin, but I'm for saying what the Bible says makes it a sin. <coughs> With due respect to Bill Gothard. <laughs> my love and I feel I'm Gothardian but I still feel that Gothard would agree that you've got to go by what the Bible says I had another brother come to me and he suggested the spilling of semen and uh, the Levitical code you know made one unclean That's, that is no more a sin as it's described than a woman having her menstrual period and you know uh, having the bloody show is sinful there had to be a ceremonial cleansing with the spilling of semen. And there had to be a ceremonial cleansing because of the menstrual cycle, because of uh, uh, just the way the law was set up. There are reasons for that we, that we don't need to get into. But, but uh, it, doesn't make, it doesn't suggest that there's no teaching that masturbation in and of itself uh, is the sin. But there's so many other principles that come together that you, I can say that I believe masturbation for an adult is sinful. But, for the, but not, not because of the act, because of the heart, because of the thought. Does that make sense? And I want you to show me a better way, if there's another way. Because it would make me get along better with some other folks. <laughs> but I think we have to see it as God sees it. And I think that's his, he represents it in the Word. And somebody else brought me up the sin of Onan in uh, 38 <laughs> Genesis. The sin of Onan, uh, if you look at it, was the sin... He, 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 he spilled his semen, it says, so that he could not have children by the woman he had to take to be his wife, by the, uh, uh, the emerging law. And uh, that was not God's will. And, uh, but the scripture does not teach masturbation in that point. I mean, the, 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 he was just not conforming to the will of the Lord. And uh, I really think you have to work at it to say that the Bible teaches that in and of itself, uh, uh, masturbation is, is sinful. Masturbation is sinful because you cannot separate thought life from action in the adult. Brother? The Bible in the New Testament says that nature itself teaches us what's right and what's wrong. Okay. And him that knows the right thing to do and he doesn't do it, it's sin. That's and right. On the other hand, if he knows what he's not supposed to do and he does it, it's going to be sin. That's right. But I'm saying that there's no, there's no standard that comes right out and says it. However, if you have a conviction in your heart that it's wrong, you know, and you go against that conviction in your heart, then I think you could be sinning against the Lord. Yes, sir. Good point. Ma'am. Brother David, what kind of interest in it and has the same sense of view as you and it keeps an interest of the Lord? That's good to know. Thank you. <laughs> then I'll see you Thursday. <laughs> Any other comment, ma'am? Uh, the question was, are you aware of selective perception? No, ma'am, most of the time you're not. You don't get a little, you know, ringing in your ears when you start being selectively perceptive. The point you need to make, and the, 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 the carefulness in your spirit that you need to have, is that when you have somebody who's saying something that you disagree with, remember that you have a propensity to cut them off, to not hear them. Okay, you get your guard up, and you don't even want to process what they're saying. Now remember that you're so busy reacting against, you refuse to hear them, and you're a lot of times going to be sitting down with people who are off spiritually, who are wrong, who are sinful, and you've got selective perception going for you, and and and, and you got to remember that you're going to have those things that, that 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 propensity working against you. You're not going to understand them unless you hear them. And remember, you're not compromising your soul to hear somebody talk in an unseemly way. You can hear it. God will, to the pure, all things are pure, the scripture says. You can minister to the most ungodly person sitting in front of you without falling away. But you've got to hear them. One of the hardest types of people for me to talk to are people who disagree with me on, on spiritual matters. 
You, know, you can talk politics, and I can let you even be a communist. I think you're wrong, you know, but I, I don't really get it. Don't get nearly as upset as something that's dear to me, like my personal beliefs. And that's what we're ministering about primarily, isn't it? I remember we had a 45-minute session of worship in a meeting that I was a part of. 45 minutes of nothing but worship and, and, and singing in tongues and tongues. And I'm a new guy to charismatic circles. That's a long time for me. Uh, and I got moving into passivity. I mean, I had a temptation to become passive. We know what happens when we get passive, right? And so anyway, I took it to a, 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 a group that uh, I was uh, fellowshipping, and, uh, and I got the group very upset with me for suggesting that 45 minutes of, of worship in tongues wasn't the most beautiful thing in the world. And uh, I really upset them because uh, they'd had experiences that were very dear to them. You know, and, and, and uh, it was very difficult for them to listen to my position even. And it was very difficult for me because I remember how I felt about after 20, 25 minutes. I started getting past it. Rum dumb, I felt, you know. And just willing to take no matter what came or whatever idea came. And, and uh, uh, I think that can be dangerous unless the Lord calls you into it. So I had difficulty listening to them. They had difficulty listening to me over something as simple as worship, the issue of worship. Isn't that amazing? We had difficulty resolving our difference when I just casually mentioned the problem that I had because of selective perception. Are you hearing? Big people, grown up people, oh, kids. We loved each other, yet we had difficulty. Hard to listen to another point of view, different from your own, because of selective perception. One, two, we've got to get on three. Yes? <laughs> yeah, last Thursday night. We have uh, what we call intensives for uh, our singles. Any, anybody's welcome. But we, we are in a little box called the singles department, so we stay in our box, but you can come. Um, we discussed last week uh, uh, determining a call to ministry. And um, uh, we will pick up from there. We're, we're going through six weeks of intensives on ministry. And when I say intensives, that means we have more to communicate in the hour, hour and a half that we have together, late at night, than we can possibly get out. And there's constant interaction. We had about a dozen people meeting together. We've had as, uh, as many as a hundred in times past, depending on the topic. Uh, love and marriage is a little more uh, popular. But uh, you're sure welcome. Now we're just going to pick up where we left off, uh, helping each person come to a conviction about his call to ministry. That's Thursday night at GLH uh, upstairs. Two. I barely could too. The sister was saying, uh, honesty in someone else is threatening. We were resting on that, Joel, not too long ago. Um, you get into a situation where somebody starts opening up, and uh, if they open up, the, the, the name of the ball game is, uh, you know, uh, turnabout's fair play. If they start opening up, you get the feeling, you're going to have to open up. And you don't want to open up. <laughs> and so that's what makes it threatening, see. You get into a social encounter, okay, and somebody starts opening up. And it makes you very uncomfortable because the, the implication is that you're going to have to open up or deal with what they're opening up about. You don't want to deal with it. You don't want to get that close. Because you don't want to get, have anybody get that familiar with, with you. It's a good point. <coughs> but sister, I, I've got to say, this is the class where we've got to deal with some of these issues. If we don't hit it here, we just won't hit it. And everybody will just kind of fly by the seat of their pants. You know, and, and, and when we can fly by instruments instead of the seat of our pants, it's an advantage. When we've got the guide, you know, the word... Not this one, but the word of God. <laughs> We've got the word, and, and it gives us some direction. I think we ought to take advantage of it. We can be misunderstood. Yeah. Uh, this is why we have to get into that section in, in, in section three about trustability. We've got to build trust. Okay? If somebody doesn't trust us, it's difficult to have a meaningful relationship. All right, number three, we've got to go on to the second point. All right. Thank you. The second point is found in Romans 13, 14. We'll give you a chance for more discussion after this. Romans 13, 14. Really, my lecture today was on uh, was continuing what we left off with in alcohol and uh, drug abuse. And we will still get to it, I hope. Just be a lecture behind. But it's Romans 13, 14. Somebody read it to me, please. Who's got her? Okay. Yeah, uh, real loud, if you could, please, ma'am. This is Romans 13, 14. 
Okay. Yeah. But clothe your clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and require and make no provision for indulging the flesh. But put a stop to thinking about evil cravings of the physical nature to gratify the Did anybody hear that? Praise. Uh, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and don't make provision for the flesh. That's what it says in the King James. And that one it says, don't make, uh, don't provide opportunity to indulge your flesh. Making provision for the flesh. Provision for the flesh. And here's what you're going to find happening often. One of the most common experiences to man, particularly Christian men and women, is the tendency to make provision for the flesh. I'm going to make a startling, one of those startling statements that you were talking about. <coughs> I believe it's possible for you to justify just about any action you want to justify if you'll sit and think on it long enough trying to justify it. Okay? And you can do it with a Bible in hand. Let me say it again. I think it's possible to justify just about any action you want to justify if you think on it long enough with the purpose of justifying what you do. Making provision for the flesh. The reason why is because our human spirits are very active and so is the demonic. And our human spirits are constantly amoral. Okay? One of the things you learned, uh, well you don't have that uh, handout, but um, if you're measuring what you're receiving in your spirit by James 3.17. Once in a while, you're going to hear from a different spirit than the spirit of the Lord. And it can be your human spirit or it can be a demonic spirit. And a human spirit is characteristically amoral. It doesn't care what the Bible says. It just doesn't care. That's the first, that's the first indication that it's a human, your human spirit. But a demonic spirit will quote scripture and quote it well. A demonic spirit will quote scripture and quote it well and will justify biblically whatever you want to do or don't want to do. All you have to do is sit and wait long enough. That's provision for the flesh. And I do believe that there could be someone who is trying to vindicate his sexual activity, his physical stimulation, with uh, a statement that I made. I think that's entirely possible. And the brother or sister could be making provision for the flesh. And it wouldn't be uncommon. That would not be an exceptional thing to happen at all. And we should we just think about that. You're often going to be having people coming into your office or sitting down with you across from the coffee table and you'll be surprised at how hard-headed they are. And the Lord has clearly, and you're, so, you're gentle, you're not trying to say, thus saith the Lord for, you, for this person. You're not trying to do that. You're just gently ministering. And they're all upset, stressed, agitated, defensive, and fighting you. And you're not in the mood to fight at all. You're not pugnacious, but they are ready to beat you up verbally. And they have a well thought out defense for what to do. That's the human spirit and a demonic spirit helping them make provision for the flesh to excuse their own fleshly desire. It can happen. It happens often. And I'm tempted to do it every day. I don't feel real great, so I was thinking, and people encourage me, and I, that's one of the excuses. Um, there are lots of, things, lots of reasons why I don't want to do everything that needs to be done every day. You know, especially this last week when I've been fighting all these symptoms, and and uh, and uh, I have people just telling me, "Oh, you poor little thing." I mean, in that, in essence, you know, why don't you take it easy, take it easy, take it easy? Instead of, I got the strength to go ahead and put in a good day. You know, even though I'm a little sweaty, I can put in a good day, and God expects me to do it. God doesn't expect me to sit at home watching TV, popping chocolates, <laughs> and uh, so so. Uh, but I could have provision for the flesh. I could make provision for the flesh very easily. Every day I had that. Now, that just happens to be the issue today. Uh, I was actually tempted not to come to class today. I didn't want to wrestle with this issue. And 
I didn't want to, uh, you know, have any confrontation. And I didn't want to have to talk. And, you know, and I could have had a lot of provision for the flesh. I could, have, I could have justified it. And if I weren't here, I probably could have gotten by with it. And you can get by with a lot, too. You can. But it's provision for the flesh. And, and, and we have to be spirit-led to avoid it. Okay, I gotta let you go, but I want to take any more questions real quick, brother. All right, what can we do to avoid deception and avoid misquoting you? And why is our responsibility <coughs> if we hear from other people well, stepping out, stepping off the? If anybody is quoting me, uh, and of course we've got staff doing it now. Uh, all I can say is go to the horse, okay? Get it from the horse's mouth. And I'm going to tell you something else. Brethren, I am not perfected yet. And if you can show me how I can walk more correctly, please tell me. I want to do right, okay? And if I'm not where I ought to be, please come to me and restore me. Don't uh, just cross me off. Brother Butterball. I uh, heard one of the other staff members make a, a taking class during uh, the masturbation situation. That was an accident. I've, conf I've talked to my brother, and he's, yeah. yeah. And, and I, I felt that it was, and yeah. so I went to him and shared with him, and I, he had no idea yeah. that he had to Well, I told him my position just as before I came up to class, and he says, that's mine exactly, and uh, no problem. And he, well, well, I'll drop it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, I think he's, he wants to be careful. Sister, and then over here. Okay, that's a good point. Please remember, now, this is a take-home test. There's no way you can cheat on this thing, except not to do the work. All I need to know is that you've done the work. So get someone to exchange with you and to accredit your work, okay? That's all we have to do, my brethren. And if you didn't get it done today, I told you, when it comes to evaluation time, I'm flexible, I'm liberal in my spirit. You got another day. I mean, I don't care. Get it done. But I'm not, I'm not stressed, and I don't want you to be. So get somebody in your group to accredit your work, that you have done it. All right, just a minute, just a minute before you, before you depart. Now listen, uh, as you go through it, as you go through it, if somebody has left a question out, you know, they, they goofed up, they didn't, or they couldn't find the answer, give it back to them, let them finish. I want you to get an A. All right, I want you to get an A. Now some of you are going to prove, me, prove to me that you shouldn't get an A, okay? But most of you should be able to get an A. Just process this stuff. I have high expectations, but if you process it, you're going to learn something. And you're going to get your A if you just flow with me, okay, before we're done. So the next test is tougher for you to have to process that next data. And I wouldn't recommend to start it until we get closer to getting there. I heard that a few people have started that test, and you're not ready for that. That would be like me trying to pass my medical exam before I've taken pre-med, much less med school. We're going to cover a lot of data before we get there, okay, practical data. A lot of those questions are relational questions, and I got two more lectures before we get to relationships. I want to finish this one on alcoholism and drug abuse. We're going to get uh, we're going to get into handling life crises like grief. How do we handle grief and this type of thing? Then we're just going to kick off relationships, and most of those questions are on relationships. We haven't even touched it yet. My brother. Yep. Yep. Find somebody in your, well, we've got groups going. We haven't had much time to work them. But uh, get somebody in your group to accredit your work. Okay, and that's it. I just want to know what the work's done. I think it, uh, just get the grade. The grade is an A if you finished it. Get the grade to your secretary, okay? And, the, you, and you, get, you get to keep your material. Listen, keep that material. That's helpful material. Okay, you worked it through. It should, it, you should have done it in such a way that you have really learned something. The other hand, Oh, we got early? We're early? Oh. Well, quit trying to leave. What's the matter with you? <coughs> I got six minutes? I think some of you people would have left if I'd have let you. All right, we'll take questions. I'll just get them up. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. All right, let's listen to the questions, please. One. Quickly. Uh, about the mindset, I know a lot of times when I read the Bible, I, I, I read it and then, well, this is this person. And that's the, you know, the, the mindset of the, uh, 
Okay, the question has come up again. How do we avoid um, uh, our, our predisposition to be set in our ways, to be selectively perceptive? My brethren, there's no way in the world you can take a pill or, or repent of it. I mean, that's like trying to repent of your own humanity, okay? Uh, I am a human being, and I have these dispositions, okay? Um, I like an attractive uh, anything. I like beauty, okay? A thing of beauty uh, is appealing to me. I enjoy seeing, for example, beautiful colors. Uh, you know, a, a display of beautiful colors or a display of, um, of uh, a, a, a pretty picture. Okay, now, I can't repent of my enjoyment of beauty. Now, somebody could say that's indulging the flesh because I enjoy beauty. Well, it could be indulging the flesh, but it's also just a predisposition of my human nature, okay? I'm recommending that you just be aware that you have some predispositions and ask the Spirit of God to give you control over those predispositions, okay? And so when I see a thing of beauty, I don't have to covet it. I see someone else driving a beautiful Cadillac or a beautiful Oldsmobile, see? And I'm clunking along in my 71 Chrysler. I thank the Lord for my 71 Chrysler. But I still think that Cadillac's pretty, okay? That Oldsmobile really looks snazzy. But I don't have to covet it, Okay? You see what I'm saying? And so I can be spirit controlled. And if I'm spirit controlled, I won't covet it. And I'll be thankful for my 71 Chrysler. You with me? Okay, same thing goes. Somebody comes to me and they got the strangest notion that I'm wrong. Brother Davis, how can you believe? That's how they start off, see? Okay. Now I got this predisposition in my spirit to turn them off. And nobody else has that, right? Somebody comes to me and says I'm wrong, I have a predisposition. But I've got a, I know, because I'm spirit controlled, I know I've got that predisposition. Okay? And so love in me says, listen and understand. Find out where they're coming from. Okay? Be thoroughly understand. Make them feel love. Make them feel understood. Then ask the Spirit of the Lord to give you wisdom to lead them. Okay? You cannot do away with your predispositions by uh, virtue of the fact that you're human. You can't do away with them. But you can mortify the deeds of the flesh. You can put them to death by being spirit controlled. Now, remember our model that we had up there and we talked about how we are spirit controlled? It involves three things in the soul, remember? First of all, we have to identify right. Right? We identify with what? Your life is hid with Christ in God, okay? I am in Christ. I am in Christ. This is Romans chapter 8. Then we have to what? Reckon right. Think right. Remember? First we have to we identify right. We get that, that, that part of our being that is aware of, of self. That our self has to be lost in his self. Okay? We, 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 our life is hid with Christ in God. Second, we've got to reckon ourselves to be dead indeed into sin. That's Romans 8, 11, I think. 1 through 10 has to do with identifying right. Romans 8, 11 has to do with thinking right. Okay? And so, I'm in Christ when he's crucified. I'm in Christ when he's buried. I'm in Christ when he rises in the newness of life. And I just think that. Then it says, therefore, don't let sin have reign over your mortal body. But like somebody who's alive from the dead, yield, now will right. Okay, now I yield myself like a person who's alive from the dead, and I walk around like a person who's alive from the dead. And if I believe, if I have done the other two things, if my life is if I uh, uh, identified right and I thought right, then I'll be able to will right, and I'll have control, and I will not let my selective perception ruin my capacity to listen to somebody who disagrees with me. Okay. Because sin doesn't have to rule over me. I'll mortify, I'll put to death the deeds of the flesh by walking in the Spirit or by being filled and staying filled with the Spirit, however your nomenclature is. A lot of Christians get filled once and then they quit. Hear me? Just because you get filled with the Spirit doesn't mean you can coast into the kingdom. You've got to keep on being filled. And that's what we're talking about. I said two. Who was two? Sir? Also, I think part of the answer is this <coughs> the scripture that we learned last week in the memory thing about add to your faith goodness and so on and so on, and incorporated in, in uh, self-control and brotherly kindness, realizing that our perceptions change perhaps daily a little bit. Uh, like there probably isn't a, a single person in here who chapel on a day when they haven't really been feeling all that good was pretty long. You know, 30 minutes was a long time to have chapel when you weren't in the spirit and not feeling very good. Yet tomorrow when you come feeling good, 
30 minutes isn't long enough. Okay, now you can, I don't feel good today, but I'm still in the spirit. Yeah. Okay, I don't. I just don't feel like rejoicing at the particular moment. Okay, but I can still offer the sacrifice of prayers. Sure. What I feel like. Okay. Well, I didn't want you to think that feeling good is necessary to be in the spirit. No, no, no. Okay. okay, three. That's a good point. Okay, the point that he's making is we can grow. We get better at it. How you work at it today is not going to be as good as how you work at it in five years. If you work at it, okay, you'll get better at it. You'll listen better when somebody disagrees with you as you practice it. That's what he's saying. Three? Who's uh, three? We haven't been in our for a while. <coughs> <laughs> I don't know who wants this. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else like that? Okay, he found out. Who's his brother's secretary? Let's help these wayward lambs. Anybody have his brother in the group? Anybody? All right, secretary Stan. All secretary Stan. <coughs> okay, find one and attach yourself, all right? Okay. Listen, here's how we're going to handle this. Uh, you're right, I haven't worked the groups because I've had more to do than I've been able to get done. I'm sorry, it's like today we, we get backed up. Secretaries, I will let you collect the, the materials, okay? You can get their name and, and, and uh, after they have accredited, okay? Make sure that your name is on your paper before you give someone else to accredit. Don't require the secretaries to do all the checking, all right? Get somebody else. And then, after it's been accredited, turn it into your secretary. Now, secretary, stand again. Okay? These are the people who will collect these tests. And you'll get them back from these people. Yeah. Okay, everybody see a secretary? You just find one, brother, and attach yourself. All right? Okay, thank you very much. You can be seated. About time to go, yeah? I can't hear. No, I would, I'm asking, okay, this question. Do we need to read our brother or sister's exam? Yeah, I want you to read through it, okay? It doesn't have to be read in great detail. Not in great detail. But listen, all they had to do was take it out of the book, right? It shouldn't be a hard you know, thing to, 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 to examine. I just look through it and read a question or two and on a page. and I would, it's not, Don't make it heavy. I can't, I have never yet, and I was at Criswell, we don't have as many spirit-filled people at Criswell. I've never yet had anybody try to cheat on a take-home exam, okay? So I just don't know how you can. <coughs> Why don't you do it for him? Okay, just look through it. Or, or trade, trade with somebody else. Devil, if you can't read it, let the secretary decide. Just give it to one of the secretaries and let them worry about it, okay? Here's a sister right up here that probably would be willing to worry about it for you, okay? How does the concept of a critical spirit, I, we will hit it, but let me do it in another context, okay? It doesn't flow out of this one naturally, okay? It can kick it off, it can trigger it. That's the, that's the only relationship, yeah? Yes. Yes. Have you heard of people picking up? Have you heard of the rose-colored glasses? People will put on uh, Lutheran-colored glasses when they go to the scriptures. Wesleyan-colored glasses. Calvinistic-colored glasses. Charismatic-colored glasses. <laughs> It's true, we have a lot of predispositions as we go to the scriptures. Instead of letting the scriptures just flow and going wherever they require us to go. God needs, that doesn't mean you throw everything out. You just are aware that you have selective perception. You know, if you didn't have the Spirit of God to lead you, you'd be in trouble. Sister, you're number five. I forgot who was number four. You look so patient, but you look depressed, too. What's the matter? Okay, now a great, the, the great are done. Uh, I, I don't care when they're turned in. I just want the secretary to have them. Let's say two weeks from now. Okay, secretaries, it's your job to get to your secretary to make sure they have your name and and the fact that you did your midterm. I am not trying to make this oppressive for you. Okay, there are certain requirements of the school for a midterm. 
And I'm going along with that. The important thing to me is that it become a learning experience. Sister, quickly. Okay, there are 75 questions, right? You had to do 50. Any 50. Ma'am. Now listen, by the time you finish your final, you think it's easy now. I'm trying to give you a head start. You're getting a spring, but you're going to have to land on that board one more time before you get off, okay? And the next time, the board may be a little stiffer, okay? It's a tough test. It really is. The final exams are real tough. And don't get started yet. I just recommend it. I mean, you can look into it, but it's a toughie. And you're going to hustle. And you'll find the take home is one of the tougher ways to learn, but you'll learn. Yeah. Selective recession working or a provision for the flesh, either one. Whoever said it weren't looking out for my welfare. Oh, I'm not. I'm, I'm convinced they were not trying to love me. Yeah. No, they were careless. Uh, that's that, at least. Yeah, there was 